so good evening everybody and i want to thank uh, all of you for inviting me to share my experience of working with women in the sex trade uh, you know uh, i there are very few platforms actually that discuss and make time to understand the rights of women in the sex trade very rarely you know we find uh, the voices of these women their concerns being heard during observance days like the human rights day or human rights week or during you know 16 days of activism to end violence against women to end gender based violence it's it's very rare that uh, you know people show interest in wanting to know about the life of these women their journeys are they enjoying their rights uh, so thank you so much for you know thinking of these women and wanting to learn more about uh, their lives which also include uh, their rights uh, i also want to thank rohit gupta and all his friends and colleagues who have worked towards putting this webinar together and also the political science association of wilson college and of course all the participants of today's webinar uh, about the theme of today's webinar you know bhed bhav i i it touched me it touched me so i just want to congratulate all of you who put together this theme uh, it's it's a very apt theme i feel you know when you're talking about human rights uh we do see a lot of discrimination around us uh, a lot of discrimination based on who we are you know our caste our economic and social status which college we have studied our gender preference where we were born to whom we were born you know very often we forget that uh, all human rights are for all and it cannot be selective uh on all these counts you know when we talk about bhed bhav when we talk about uh, you know uh, discrimination we talk about human rights uh i find the women uh, that prerna the organization that i'm representing here uh, uh the women that we work with are lowest in the rank uh they are discriminated because one they are in the sex trade constantly blamed for being there constantly judged intentionally kept invisible and unheard then uh, in you know in uh, early 1990s came hiv they got blamed further they got you know they experienced discrimination even more uh, there were there was another layer of discrimination that got added into their lives and that was with covid everyone including the yale study spoke of how you know sex trade will spread covid rapidly and how we need to close down brothels and what we saw on the ground as of today you know we have a presence in almost three red light areas um, around mumbai and uh, and a red light area also in navi mumbai and uh, we didn't see a single case of covid till date in these areas but the fear the 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 response of the society the response of policy makers was so inclined towards discriminating them um you know as a society i always feel we are so confused on our stand uh, about these women we want these women in our society but we always want to keep them at the back end i often find they you know as a society we also want them for all the wrong reasons and one of the reasons often cited in several conversations that i have with different people is that you know the society needs women in the sex trade and why are they a, a necessity it is not you know it is more because people feel we'll have se- lesser rapes and lesser lesser sexual assaults on 
good girls in our society the good girls will get protected the good women of our society will be protected from sexual assault from sexual violence and rape if we have women in the sex trade in society very often i find these this segment of society thinks they are a necessary social evil this understanding is so deeply ingrained in the women themselves that women themselves have started believing this you know and all this in today's context the theme that you all have chosen i think is so relevant for us to understand the lives of these women how they understand their lives how they understand their own position in society is so critical so once again thank you so much for you know inviting me and choosing this topic uh i wanted to actually approach today's webinar by talking about our own work and i often feel that you know it is also very critical on human rights day to understand the lives of the children of these women you know often when we talk of human rights an adult comes in front of us we forget children and we feel and especially in our organization and a lot of us working in the child rights space we feel children's rights are also human rights so with your permission i'm going to start by talking about my journey the journey of our organization prerna way back in 1986 in the then largest red light area of kamatipura so like i mentioned we started work in 1986 when we saw that children here were being groomed in case of a girl child by the time she was 12 or 13 to be sold into the sex trade and in case of a boy child to be sold into the allied activities of the sex trade the young ones who were dependent on their mothers for care were intoxicated and put to bed right below you know were put to sleep right below the bed on which the mothers had to entertain customers other children a little older children would run errands for their mothers customers and in a few cases lure clients for their own mothers and other women in the brothels in the world of the sex trade the customer is the king in the evenings the mothers these women are expected to devote all their time to the customers what we witnessed as an organization was that there was absolutely no adult supervision for these children in the night and a very visible cycle of intergenerational sex trade three generations living in the same brothel three generations very often cited soliciting at the same place at the same time in the by lanes of kamatipura with no hope of breaking away the society keeping them invisible and no one cared to hear them no one made an attempt to understand their aspiration these women and children were socio economically marginalized what compounded their plight was stigma you know all that the theme uh, of today's webinar is was the stigma the discrimination and the social exclusion that they were subjected to because of being in the sex trade you know their mothers being in the sex trade and the children being born to these women the children born in these brothels who were inducted into the sex trade and allied activities of the sex trade their right to dignity and well being and their fundamental rights to survival development protection and participation was being violated this was the time you know way back in 1986 was the time where children's rights were being discussed of course there was a discussion to some extent on child trafficking but not a mention about intergenerational trafficking that exist in the sex trade commercial sexual exploitation of children which was being carried out and justified by society in the guise of hereditary sacred customs or customary practices this is where our journey of breaking the intergenerational cycle of trafficking into the sex trade began our intervention started with understanding what these women you know the mothers the women in the sex trade wanted for their children <coughs> excuse me and every mother every woman in the sex trade we met way back in 1986 and till today all they wanted was a way out of the sex trade for their children a life of dignity is what they said 
اینی تھنگ بٹ دا سیکس ٹریٹ سو ویری آفن یو نو وین ویمن سے عزت کی زندگی سو وی آس دیم واٹ ڈز عزت کی زندگی مین فار یو یو نو اینڈ دے سے اینی تھنگ بٹ اے لائف ان دا سیکس ٹریٹ فار آر چلڈرن دس از ہاؤ یو نو وی کنسیپچولائز دا فرسٹ نائٹ کیئر سینٹر Uh, and started planning and of course you know in this vision we involved the mother for us it was so important that we listen to these women in the sex trade we we hear them and we you know get their ideas on starting a service which will protect the rights of their children which was denied all throughout just because they were born to prostituted women and they were born in the red light area so like i said yeah involving the women in reimagining a life for their children where would they want to see their children we involve them to become the part of the solution and i'm saying this here because when we are talking about the rights of women in the sex trade we very rarely involve them to become part of their solutions you know they have problems do we talk to them do we listen to them do we assist them so that they can make informed choices and i think today's women are you as you know young leaders uh, should should pay a lot of attention on how much do we listen to people and how much do we make people part of the solution which is affecting them on a daily basis so moving forward ab- about our own journey providing a safe place it was so important for us to provide a safe space for these uh, children uh, away from the brothels uh, this is what the mother wanted for their children you know like i said a life of dignity a life which would have nothing to do with the sex trade um, and uh, you know how could how could these be you know what the women wanted was for us to ensure that the violence that they endure day in and day out the violence that they experience day in and day out in these brothel at least their children are not exposed to this they wanted their children to be able to make choices decide their own path besides the night care center we also supported the children with their education mental health being a very very important component well being being a very important component we some among these children some of them needed long term residential care we assisted them assisted them to access identity documents what we brought into our programs was rights are unconditional and that's why i brought up our entire work uh, you know in today's webinar shared our work with you for us somewhere to understand that when we talk of human rights they have to be unconditional uh this all this that we did wasn't difficult wasn't easy at all it was very challenging challenging on many fronts <clears throat> you know when working we what what we found was initially of course not all women uh trusted us and we had to work around earning their trust their confidence in us and confidence in positive change in their lives and mutual respect what we should also understand uh, uh, and it's very important i feel is uh, that these women their lives are not hunky dory huh? their lives are not what the hindi movies try to tell us uh, or sometimes try to show you know their life every day is filled with violence and normalizing a uh, normalization of violence makes it seem like violence solves problem this is not good for growth well being and development and this is something that is rarely discussed when we talk about women in the sex trade for us it was also important that we change perception about women in the sex trade we change people's perception and you know i love these kind of webinars and I, you know i'm so happy you'll organize this because this also means that today after my sharing i feel y'all are going to represent these women and y'all are going to try and change people's perception about these women 
it's also you know when we understand when we talk about women in the sex trade and their rights it's so important to also understand human trafficking i feel you cannot understand sex trade unless and until or you know like you all gave the title uh, to this webinar women and sex work or women in sex work you cannot understand all this unless and until you do not understand human trafficking uh there are still several people who feel trafficking is a myth all women in the sex trade come are or end up into the sex trade out of choice these are issues which i feel all of us need to question we need to explore we need to understand we need to you know listen to the stories of these women did they come into the sex trade out of choice because i feel even these kind of lack of understanding uh, of the reality is violation of human rights of these women uh are also uh, you know uh, are challenges uh, while working with these children and women also began when society keeps asking you for guarantees so you know even we were asked if they if people gave us donation if they invested in these children will they not enter the sex trade was a question constantly asked to us and even to some extent to today also people ask us we understood it as for us you know working with children working with uh, supporting the children born in these red light areas was human rights and we feel human rights are basic rights and freedoms that belong to every person in this world from birth till death they apply regardless of where you are from what you believe or how you choose to live your life they can never be taken away sometimes uh, sorry they are under unconditional although they can sometimes be restricted of course that i understand so for a child born in the brothel you give them access to education ensure their protection without conditions at that point don't make it conditional to how he will use that right once they become an adult you know and i often look at myself i have received education all throughout from my schooling day to my post graduation day in a government subsidized educational institution and when i received subsidy for my education nobody asked me or nobody took down anything in writing from my parents or from me saying that you know if the government is investing so much on your education give us guarantee that you'll become a responsible productive citizen so there are certain rights there are rights which have to be given to people without asking them how are you going to use that in future and this is something we often found being asked about these children it was a challenge to explain to people that we all of us we are often the sum of our surrounding we are who we are like for example you know all of you sitting here having the privilege of being students of wilson college we are all who we are because of the opportunities we have had the people we were surrounded with you know with and the good and bad things that have happened to us and everyone deserves a violence free equal empathetic safe enabling environment you deny that to a child and uh, you know things could go wrong for that individual similarly you know within the night care center of course uh, you know starting the night care center was difficult we we faced criticism because people said by taking care of children of these women we were letting these women be irresponsible parents and letting them continue to be coat and coat frivolous i'm not calling them frivolous but i'm just telling you what people thought and even today people very often feel that all women in the sex trade are in the sex trade because these are different women they are frivolous women they you know they are immoral women and of course today when we get more time we'll probably explore that as well uh, i know rohit also asked me to talk a little bit about what happened to these women in the red light areas or those who don't even live in the red light area but are in the sex trade during covid yes many of us you know on a daily basis different channels updated us on you know 
uh, about the covid outbreak the pandemic the lockdown uh, very often we were told or not very often i mean every day the numbers of uh, people infected the death toll but uh, you know i found very little being discussed about the consequences and especially consequences related to certain marginalized vulnerable populations of our society uh, and uh, with covid what we found was that uh, consequences uh, there were profound consequences on uh, the hidden victims and i call uh victims of human trafficking the hidden victims for all of us uh, you know uh, these victims uh, uh you know some of us during this time kept saying that maybe new human trafficking uh, activities may have decreased during lockdown and some of us also kept asking about uh, you know if these types of activities have ceased entirely and it was during this time that un issued a statement it was actually a warning and i would like to quote them so what the un said was there are fears that covid-19 is making the task of identifying victims of human trafficking even more difficult they are also more exposed to contracting the virus less equipped to prevent it and have less access to healthcare to ensure their recovery essential and practical operations to support them have become a challenge due to countries adjusting their priorities during the pandemic and i once again you know want to bring you all to the statement about how countries were adjusting their priorities during pandemic and women in the sex trade their children young children trafficked for commercial sexual exploitation at that point in time definitely was not the priority uh, well what happened in the red light area as soon as you know in march 2020 um, the brothels were shut down um, there was strict vigilance uh, being kept no outside outsider was allowed to come in relief work poured in the red light areas like kamatipura and of course not so much in lesser known red light areas uh women um, were not allowed to move out of the red light area there was so much of uncertainty that they were experiencing they didn't know where they stand what would happen to them there was nobody going out there and telling giving them information all that was happening in the public space in the media was a blame game a fear that would these women spread the virus even further would they be the cause of further spread of virus in in our uh, society these were discussions that were being uh, that were being held but not anybody reaching out to them and giving them information that they were you know eagerly waiting to hear what should they be doing how should they protect themselves and their children of course there were a handful of ngos who also had difficulty accessing them because there was no public transport and developmental work social workers the work that they were doing was not recognized as essential service by government therefore mobility was such a big challenge and reaching these women was such a big challenge of course like i said there was a lot of you know relief work that was happening but relief work concentrated in kamatipura everybody wanted to help women in kamatipura which was of course required but there were other red light areas there were women who were spread across the city and in the adjoining districts of mumbai city and there was no relief work reaching them at all i mean there was a day when i we remember uh, where women walked all the way from sayan to kamatipura because they got to know there was a lot of relief work uh, women were receiving in kamatipura and they are my god you should have seen their feet when they reached our center in kamatipura so this was the plight and of course you know like i kept saying uh, we don't listen to women we don't listen to people we don't want to understand what their needs are so people kept giving relief kits as per 
their understanding and not understanding what women need so what what happened was women had especially in kamati pura there were some women who had certain essential basic groceries but they didn't know how to cover the cost of cooking fuel they didn't know how to cover the cost of medicines and of course they had no income like i said because all the brothels were shut down and there was a strict vigilance from the police on who enters in and who exits women had absolutely no source of income and they started borrowing and let me tell you this borrowing was not new to women in the sex trade they were already indebted what happened was the lockdown pushed the women further into debt since the lockdown you know during the lockdown i'm sure many of you also heard about domestic violence and everybody you know all of us started calling it the shadow and the invisible pandemic while there was so much being spoken about domestic violence not a word was discussed in the media or on any platform about the violence experienced by women in the sex trade violence from their pimps their perpetrators these were you know because women were not making were not making bringing in income for these perpetrators for their pimps the pimps and the perpetrators were displacing their frustration their anger on these supportless women especially the women who were not making any money for them we also saw some women moving out and returning back to their villages but many weren't also wanting to go back to their villages because they weren't sure whether they would be welcome and you know in the past whenever some of these women have been going back to their villages they find their welcome in their villages not because uh, their family wants them but because women come with some resources for their family and this time women realized that they were going back without resources and they were going back actually dependent on their families hoping that their families will support them and there were women who felt that they would be unwelcome they also realized that the families might consider them as further burden on the already crumbling economy of their own families and like i mentioned earlier you know there was this this yale study which added to their uh, to their uh, to their uh, condition to their distress which uh, which recommended closing down of all places where sex work was being uh, carried out because they sex they said sex work may reduce projected covid-19 death toll if we close down these brothels and these places uh and uh, you know uh, it would ease um post uh, the lockdown it would it would help ease the lockdown measures so this added further fear among policy makers for the fear among civil society and uh, they were happy to give them relief but everybody was of the opinion that brothel should not be open and sex workers or you know women in the sex trade should not be seen outside soliciting um uh, i also want to you know talk a little bit about the work that uh, during this time because you know very often there is this understanding that um, uh these women uh, there is no protection under law for these women i just want to bring it uh, here for discussion and for the information of all of you that all laws that you and i enjoy these women can enjoy nobody can deny there's no law in our country which says if you are in the sex trade or if you are a sex worker these are the rights that would be denied to you absolutely no there is no law which says that despite that we do say we do see that women find it so difficult to access their right to their identity documents access justice access social security documents access social security entitlements during the pandemic we as an organization worked a lot around ensuring women in the sex trade access their right to identity accept their right to social security document because it 
oh, you know, it was only with these two rights would they be able to access entitlements. I must, uh, you know, um, mention here that the government made a lot of effort. Again, I'm saying this was not uniform, okay? This was not seen in other red light areas, unfortunate. And this is something that we need to moving forward always discuss is whenever we are talking about human rights, is it uniform? You know, and when you look deeper down, you'll realize it is never uniform. So similarly, when it came to government declaring certain provisions, certain <clears throat> services for these women, only a handful of women managed to access them. So what were the services that the government declared? Universally, the government declared free ration card, uh, sorry, a free ration for a couple of months for people from the marginalized section. And yes, in Kamatipura, in Falkland Road, in Vashi Turbe, we mobilized these women, we mobilized the concerned department and ensured that each one of these women could access these entitlements. Similarly with identity documents, similarly with documents like food cards. Then the government of Maharashtra declared some relief, financial relief to these women, you know, for three months, each woman in the sex trade received X amount. And if they had a child going to the school, then they, there was an additional amount to support children, school going children was also declared. And we ensured that these women would access these entitlements. Now, again, having said that, did this happen uniformly everywhere? Absolutely no. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, sexual violence again. Uh, I'm sure we often, you know, you open a newspaper and every day there is a news around sexual assault, sexual violence, rape, but you will very rarely find news about sexual violence, rape or sexual assault on women in the sex trade because the societal's understanding and the understanding of law enforcement and other duty bearers is that women in the sex trade can never ever come forward and talk about sexual violence. They cannot complain and say I was being raped. They cannot complain and say, uh, you know, I was sexually assaulted. And it's often linked with the money that the customer pays them. It's often linked with, oh, you gave a service and you got paid for it, now don't come forward and complain. So when you're talking about human rights and you students, you know, moving forward, I'm sure many of you as students of political science will take up issues. You will be sitting on a table where policies are being formulated for the marginalized community. Do think about issues like this. See, here is the discrimination that we talk about. Here is the bhedbhav that we talk about. Uh, moving forward, I also want to bring uh, one topic and maybe I'll stop and then we can go in for question answers is, you know, uh, one news item that you always read in the newspapers when it comes to women and children in the sex trade, women and children and human trafficking is the whole issue of rescue. I feel even in this area in, you know, Around rescue, there is a lot that we need to understand in the context of human rights. Are the rescued person, be it a child or be it a woman who is rescued, an adult who is rescued, a person who is rescued, are we treated, treating them as victims or do we treat them as offenders even when they are being rescued? Do we listen to them? Is, are they being involved in what they want post-rescue, what they want to do with their lives moving forward? Are we assisting them so that they can make informed choices? Is it even important for us as duty bearers, as civil society, to understand what their needs are and what are their aspirations? And very often we find even here their human rights are being violated. We need to believe them and we need to trust them. I often find that, you know, uh, we do not trust them. We do not even trust that they can think for themselves. You know, 
uh, we don't even spend time understanding that rescue and rehabilitation is the right of these women and children, is the right of these individuals. And it is not a favor that is being done to them. Very often law enforcement feels it's a favor that they're doing by rescuing them. We also need to have a better understanding, a holistic understanding of what is rehabilitation and how do we ensure sustainable rehabilitation? Do we involve them in imagining, in reimagining what can be a holistic, sustainable rehabilitation for them? So, you know, these are some of the rights that I often feel uh, uh, either absolutely not discussed or even if they are discussed they are very at a very superficial level uh, i think at this stage i would like to stop because uh, there's there's a lot that we can discuss there's a lot we can talk about but maybe we can take a few questions and uh, you know maybe a lot might come out uh, during our discussion uh, moving forward does that work for all of you present here Okay, okay. So, so we have the chat box, and uh, you know, so either people can type their questions or uh, Anushka. I am presuming you're moderating. Okay, so I I can see some questions. Should I just go through them? Oh, there are a lot of comments. I'm so happy. No, no. Ma'am, um, those were just running notes. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, we were uh, we were just okay. typing down what you were um, saying so that okay, it would be okay. clear for everyone if they had a bad okay. internet connection or anything like that. Okay, okay. So maybe uh, Atiya or Anushka or Rohit, maybe y'all can tell me if there are any questions. Ma'am, I'm here. Yeah, I had a question. Am I audible? Yes, you are. You yeah. are. So ma'am, you mentioned that uh, people had criticized when you started a night uh, care center for uh, the children, for the women who were working in red light areas. And you mentioned that uh, there were people who criticized this. So how did you deal with those people? And like, how did you work around them? Did you like convince them or how was the, that part of the journey? Oh, that's such a good question. Thanks for asking me that question. Yes. Uh, you know, one thing that we always find very useful is engaging people, engaging them in a discussion, involving them in our work. You know, uh, I, I feel there are some people, uh, um, it helps involving them in, in, in the work for them to see. And, uh, you know, changing people's perception, not every day happens overnight. You know, we, we need to be very patient and we cannot leave people. We cannot write off people. That's something we learned in our journey. We need to involve them. We need to tell them. And that's exactly what we did. You know, uh, believe me, in uh, way back uh, in 1986 and even till 30 years ago, even till 25 years ago, helping people understand that human rights are unconditional and that all human rights are for everybody was such a big challenge because human rights was for a privileged few. I mean, even today it's for a privileged few, but at least, you know, like your colleges and all are talking about it. In those days, no, I think all these discussions just happened in a selected group. And most often it happened only probably in colleges of social work. But see, today we are socializing the issue, right? And I feel so happy because it is through these kind of interactions and dialogues that we start socializing issues. And for me, that is the way moving forward. Do not monopolize issues and do not monopolize interventions. Talk to people and put it on everybody's ag agenda because it is everybody's you know, I feel child protection, human rights is everybody's responsibility, not the responsibility of a handful of us. So you're right. We did talk to them. For those who were interested in getting involved in our work, we involved them in our work and they became the spokespersons for these women. They became the spokesperson for these children, you know, and that's how I think our work expanded. Did I did I respond to your question, 
Kiyasha, how do you pronounce? Kisha. And yes, Kisha. Okay, Kisha. Kisha. Okay, okay. Ma'am, there's a question in the chat box. If you would, either you can read it out to you or... Yeah, I'll see. No problem. Uh, where is it? Ma'am, with regards to education for both women and their children, are there any facilities, institutions, especially? Thank you for asking me this question. So I'm going to talk about two things which I didn't speak earlier. Uh, one is when you talk about education or any services, you remember Kiyasha I spoke about socializing while I was interacting, you know, responding to Kiyasha's question about socializing. Uh, you know, you students understand inclusion very well as compared to when I was your age. Okay. So one thing that played now, and it is for me linked with human rights. It is linked with Bhedbhav, you know, uh, that uh, the topic, the theme of your uh, webinar is let's have an inclusive policy when it comes to everybody, you know. So very often I have people approaching me saying, why don't we start separate educational institutions for these children? You know, exclusive for them so they are not stigmatized and discriminated against. And I feel that's that's a very, very long strategy. If you want to ensure human rights, you have to be inclusive. There are enough schools. What is the problem is what we need to see is are they accessible? Are they affordable? And are they approachable? Are they accessible for all? So human rights comes in, right? Are they affordable for all? And are they approachable for all? So that is something that Predna has constantly worked around is there are municipal schools and it is their, it's the right of these children to avail education. Similarly, vocational training. Similarly, childcare institutions, you know. So our biggest fight was with the childcare institutions which refused to admit children in need of care and protection only because they were born to prostituted women and born in the red light area. So they felt, you know, oh God, these children have seen so much of sex. Sex runs in their blood as if every anything about sex is bad. You know, so sex runs in their blood and they will be a bad influence for our children in our childcare institutions. Similarly, with educational institutions, you know, there were schools which fell. If children from the red light area come into our schools, they will corrupt the mind of our good children. You know how our society loves to compartmentalize everybody into good and bad fair and dark you know we love these compartments and obviously you know we find our experiences they the compartment in which these children these women are put are in though in the compartment which we define as bad so there are educational institutions all we need to ensure is that women and children are not denied access to these facilities just because of their background, just because they they are in the sex trade or they were born to women in the sex trade. So during the pandemic, yes, just like all the other marginalized children who had no access to digi digital device. No, we, we spoke a lot about the digital divide, which affected the education of the marginalized community. It did affect these children as well. For those who had the support of NGOs like Prerna, they did not suffer because we mobilized resources for them. And not just us, you know, whichever NGO who had access to these children or children who had access to NGOs did get these services, but not all. And yes, they suffered. We are very, very concerned about those children who, whom we feel, you know, fell through the cracks. And unfortunately, there was nobody to support them or even today there's nobody to support them or probably they've gone unnoticed even after they fell through the cracks. And that is the challenge moving forward. And I often say, you know, one strategy that we lack is outreach. We sit in our offices and expect people to come to us. We don't reach out to people. We don't go out there to find where are these people who probably don't even know they have rights that they can access. You know, we need to go and tell them, hey, you and I have equal rights. Uh, Sana, did I respond uh, to your question? 
Sana. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Sana. Ma'am, I have a question. Yes, uh, yes, Sachi. Uh, so while talking about uh, victims of sex workers, there's often a big chunk of group called the trans women who are just left out of the conversation. Yes. Is your organization working for them as well? Okay, good question. So uh, here I want to make one uh, submission and that is when I was speaking, I used the term children, women and individuals because I was covering everybody, okay? For me, these are persons. Uh, as an organization, we have worked a lot with children and women. Our experience of working with uh, transgenders and, you know, others has been very limited, not because uh, this was not a choice that we made in that sense. It wasn't, you know, a decision where we said we won't work with trans women. It's just that, uh, you know, we didn't have that many resources. The work is so much. And uh, with limited resources, we could have done only this much. Um, and I'm so glad, Sakshi, you brought it up. And I'm hoping that moving forward, people in this audience would, uh, you know, take up the issue of trans women as well in the sex trade and see how uh, they can support them. Uh, so that, uh, you know, these women also do not find their rights being violated. Thanks for bringing that up, Sakshi. Ma'am, um, I have a question. Yes. I'm so sorry, there's a question in the chat box as well. Chat box, okay. Are there any institutions or policies to facilitate health? care services okay great question this is from priyanka priyanka like i said you know if there is a municipal hospital every individual have a, has an access to municipal hospital i cannot be denied access just because i am in the sex trade the issue here is the bhedbhav. The minute I disclose that I'm... So it, it is not that we lack services and we lack policies. What we lack is our attitude, the right kind of attitude. What we lack is, you know, how do we get rid of stereotypes and biases? How do we address stereotypes and biases? What we lack is being mindful. What we lack is compassion. What we lack is understanding of, of equality. So this is what we need to change. Remember one thing, bringing in more policies and more laws does not solve problems. Okay? Does not ensure equality, will not ensure that people enjoy human rights. What really changes is when you have services and when you have services which, which believe in equality, when you have, when you invest in human resources. So two kinds of investment. One, in having enough human resources so that everybody is reached out. You reach out to people, you know, people get those services. The other is, are we investing in training of these human resources. See, we all come with a baggage, right? We all come with a baggage. We all learn. We all unlearn. We all relearn. Do I have that space where I can learn, I can unlearn, I can relearn, and I will not be judged in this journey? So this is what I feel moving forward is so, so required and not just have these paper documents. Oh God, we have so many paper documents. They are there in place. We create them and we don't look at them. So let's create them and let's see how they are unfolding on the ground. Let's see what are the gaps and let's see how do we plug those gaps. What are the budgetary allocations we do to plug those gaps? And yes, there aren't enough. Like, you know, I'll just tell you, Priyanka, there is a, there is a home for uh, rescued girls in Maharashtra. 
and it's in such an appalling uh, condition that recently we then stepped in with a lot of volunteers volunteers like you volunteers like doctors who were gynecologists skin spe specialists who came in because the girls were having so many reproductive health care issues reproductive infection issues and skin issues so you know there is unfortunately there are times when there is a need and there are resources i'm not saying we are a society which has resources in abundance but there are people wanting to help there is resources but there is no connect here you know that journey of connecting these two people sometimes does not happen and of course very often there are there is the need and there is lack of resources so let's build on these resources let's see how we can you know plug those gaps around resources Priyanka could i respond to your question for me you know i feel yes, yes uh, ma'am okay Thank okay you. for okay for me you know i feel just like i was when i was your age i think we should all be open to to developing and evolving and uh, an understanding around this it will evolve i mean even today i tell people i'm no expert you know i'm work in progress so i come for uh, webinars like this only because young minds ask me such questions and they also challenge me and then i start thinking and i start evolving as a human being you know so yeah i think uh, we all uh, should be open to that yes anushka Yes. 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 uh oh, you you know you have the answer anushka mental health in india and in many parts of the world is a very tabooed uh, issue right it's it's we don't speak about it even i'm sure even among you no among your peers if somebody was to say i see a therapist our immediate reaction would be oh god she has a mental health problem oh god you know she is not fine right the other reason is you cannot touch and feel mental health issues right you can't touch like physical you can touch you can see a wound you can see a blood you can see a uh, a swelling you can't see that when it comes to mental health so it's very hard for people to understand and to believe and trust what we are saying third mental health yes is very 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 new to us it's very urban centric believe me you know it is uh, even today whatever little discussions we are having we are having it in the richer urban circles it has not reached the marginalized even within the urban areas and i don't know when it will reach uh, the peri urban and rural areas uh, it is expensive anushka you know mental health services are very expensive they they don't come i remember there was this child who came to our child care institution and uh, you know there was some gesture that she made and we were worried about it and uh, after about a few weeks she disclosed about sexual assault but she wasn't opening up and she was a child with with uh, learning disability and you know this was almost 6 years ago anushka i'm talking about so we wanted a a mental health professional who understood learn you know who has experience of working with children with learning and disability and sexual you know sexual violence and we had to pay her for one sitting 
in six years ago, 1,500. So, so just, just imagine where would a poor person, where would a woman in the sex trade, where I had, you remember I said the client is the king and the other person is the pimp and the perpetrator. They are not going to invest in her mental health. They don't even care. For them, it is she's a money-making machine. So, you know, just make money for us. I'm not going to invest in you for your mental health. You know, and um, unfortunately, women in the sex trade can't even prioritize. Yeah? They don't have the luxury of prioritizing uh, and uh, and giving, uh, you know, uh, investing on their mental well-being, on their well-being. It's so unfortunate, but that's the fact. So, yes, uh, we should talk about it. And Anushka, in the month of February, as a matter of fact, we as an organization, we are going to be having, holding a webinar on, um, um, you know, laws related to mental health and our rights on mental health. So, I will, you know, because I have Rohit's contact, I will certainly share uh, the details. But, you know, you should use as student your platforms as well and, have hold these kind of webinars and you know also try and see how you can reach out to uh, other communities especially the marginalized communities so that uh, you know the myths around mental health the acceptance around mental health increases the myths are addressed and, uh, you know, the taboos around mental health are addressed. Uh, before going further, I also want to tell you all that we have a very interesting online resource um, on human trafficking. And I'm going to type it out. I would be very happy if you can access it, all of you, and give us your feedback on that. It's like your one-stop shop on uh, human trafficking issues. Um, we post a lot of articles, a lot of on-ground uh, information on this. Please access it. Please give us your feedback. Uh, we are, I mean, regularly wanting feedback so that we can make it more user-friendly and, uh, you know, post things that people find useful or want more information on. Uh, there is a question here. Anushka, could, could I answer your question? What are the measures or support we can take to help victims of sex work? So I think this webinar is a good start where, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, you know, bringing, uh, bringing uh, the issue in the public domain, right? As students, you're trying to understand this issue. You're trying to socialize this issue. And then I, you know, um, uh, very often I tell this to your generation, you all are on social media, uh, a lot on social media. And I always urge uh, students to at least, you know, dedicate one day in a week or one post in a month or two posts in a month dedicated to a social cause. Talk about a social cause. You know, share something around. I know you will sound different in your peers. You know, they would, you have, you know, your peers going in one direction and they might call you a, I know it happens, you know, there is the peer pressure. They might call you a snob. They might say, oh, she's trying to show off. Uh, but yeah, you know, I would still say spend some time on social media. It's a great tool to, you know, initiate a conversation, get your peers to uh, think, reflect, introspect. So that's one way you can address. Uh, the third is uh, do dedicate some time uh, uh, and volunteer. You know, volunteer at a hospital. Uh, volunteer at a hospital which is closer to Kamatipura or Falkland Road or Vashi. You know, you have your two months of vacation. Volunteer with an NGO. Volunteer with a police station. You know, we feel only volunteering has to be done only in NGOs. No. Why can't we go to a police station and say, well, here I am. I have the resources. I have the time. I can give you 40 hours in the next two months, tell me how I can support you when you have cases of sexual violence or, you know, when children come to you. We have 
child welfare committee so every district there is a child welfare committee which is uh, the competent authority under the juvenile justice act to work on issues of child protection to ensure children are safe go to them approach them and see how you can help them can you you know help them as a help desk you know can you help them in any which way so i feel moving forward volunteer in doing something uh, uh where by sometimes directly and sometimes indirectly or so sometimes you are you know doing the job of gatekeeping your volunteering work is actually you know working as gatekeeping so that there is no violation happening or you are you know intervening before the damage is irreversible so these are things that perhaps you can think of doing uh i'm facing network issue okay okay i think that's if yeah. you wants to ask a question she's just sure um, yeah. ma'am i have a question like when we talk of like even you addressed in your speech about the bollywood like how they uh, depict the sex trafficking it is not like that but when we see that bollywood movies songs that the uh, that promote the sex trafficking like sexual violence against the like for the women and the songs they make it promotes a uh, sexism so what you will uh, tell about like bollywood how we should see to that i i think we should talk about it no i feel yamna we should talk about it whenever we see bollywood is uh, romanticizing sexual harassment you know when ball any any message by bollywood is actually promoting or glorifying sexual harassment sexual violence sexism i think we should talk about it and your generation has social media at your disposal i Uh, and i think you know i don't know maybe next time you next year whoever student no you should get on a twitter chat you need not all the time have webinars no there are times you can pick up these themes and have a twitter chat you can have a twitter relay you can have something on instagram i mean your you 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 your generation is a boss i learned from y'all so you know use these different mediums to discuss this i think we you know very often we feel oh god if i say will i be the odd one out and that's why we you know we refrain ourselves from speaking of course we will be the odd one out it's okay but if you feel or any one of us feels what is what is happening around us is not right um at least at least mention it at least share you know maybe there are 15 other people who feel that way and you stepping up and saying that will will support the others also to you know join you in that conversation and i often tell myself you know someone somewhere at some point in time let's say jyotiba phule and savitri bai phule let's talk about you know ambedkar ji they they stood up right and that's why today you and i are you're in wilson college i could study in tata institute of social sciences we we are all sitting here in this virtual space and discussing these issues without fear right somebody fought for our rights somebody opened up and somebody did not uh, uh, stop themselves because of the fear of consequence i think uh, you know we should think about that uh, and i am forever grateful for all those i feel uh, today what i am is because of you know the fights that people have have fought to ensure you and i are where we are today which resulted in you know you and me being where we are today ma'am um, i have a question if you like to yes yes, yes so uh, ma'am you know you mentioned the violence that these women face on a regular basis in these red light districts 
um is it more to do with people who work there like the bosses and stuff like that or people who frequent there or is it a combination of both and has been trainer good question oh my god At, uh, atia that's such a good question yes it's a violence by by all hmm very often i feel societal indifference is also a form of violence it so it starts from there now let's go in the red light area yes they experience violence by their customers they experience violence from the pimps and everybody in 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 that chain of what we call the perpetrators so there's not one single perpetrator right it starts with the person who who sourced her who lured her then there are times when there are exchange of hands so all those people then there is the police then there is the local uh, money lender from whom they have borrowed money and are not in a position to repay then there are their own family members you know we very rarely speak about the violence from their own family members there are so many women where the family members want them in the sex trade they don't want them outside the sex trade and they want their money all the time and if the women refuse to give them the money refuse to support them then that's another set of violence that these women are experiencing and of course there are customers who are very demanding there are some customers who like to reserve a woman for themselves okay they're paying her and after that they're constantly suspecting her they constantly want to ensure that if i am paying you and i have bought you for myself they want to ensure she is not unfaithful so any kind of doubt there and he is inflicting physical sexual and emotional violence on her so there are i always say there are several layers of violence with several layers of individual inflicting those violence on these women ma'am just to thank you so much for your answer as well but just to add on to that prerna has been you know trying to combat these issues so what do you think helps like teaching these women that it's not okay it's not normalized how you said you know it's normalized for these women um or talking like you know hashing it out with law enforcement what in your experience has helped even a little bit to you know combat this violence so i we we found that you know giving them information coupled with giving them the support so creating an enabling environment okay so just information in isolation does not work okay just creating a, a platform does not work so it has to all go simultaneously and in all this process having this basic understanding that these women have a voice they should be heard these women have rights and that includes right to information these women have rights and therefore their right to be heard when policies are being formulated when programs are being designed yeah these women have rights therefore create those platforms where women can participate all this together for me is what is important and what is this is what we try to create the other thing that really worked for us where women began to negotiate is when we when we supported them to change their lives of their children see all of us know at some stage have fought for rights we have we fought for our own rights but in a very different situation they fight for their rights under adverse conditions and we find that they have stood up for their children only because at the end of the tunnel they saw a light they have today they have examples of where like you know just last week we were working uh, trying to raise um, a big amount of money for a boy who's got into engineering college you know last week at the same time we were raising money for a girl who's got into bsc nursing and it's a lot of money she's got into a very good college 
So women are seeing change is possible. And what they are also realizing is that, you know, there's somebody supporting their children's life that has resulted in, you know, strengthening their negotiation power. And we, we, we have seen this and, you know, we are so sure that our assumption is so true that when you support their children, they feel more empowered to negotiate over their rights. And of course, when they, you know, when there's no, when, when they know that there are people who are not going to judge them, there are people who will continue to support them even if they withdraw. So there are times when they fight, right? They want your support to fight for their rights and they back off. So they want to complain against a perpetrator. We go to the police station, we file a complaint. Ten days later, they come and say, Mirkur, na, complaint withdraw karna hai. They know that in spite of that, it will never be held against them. If they come back again, we're still there to support them. They know there are people who have not blamed them for being in the sex trade. You know, we accept them as, as individuals, as they are. Even if they are drug dependent, we accept them. Even if, uh, you know, they are HIV, we accept them. Tomorrow, if they test COVID positive, we are going to accept them. I think this is what matters to the women. And this is the kind of support we all require, right? Whether it's a woman in the sex trade or whether you as students of Wilson College. We don't want all the time. You know, we all want to be supported in our present, now and here. We don't want anybody to hold us against our past. And I think that is what is important in our work. And that is something we constantly check whether we are on that path or, you know, we are also digressing. So. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. So I think we don't have any. There is the Bedia. Oh my God. Shakshi, thanks for asking this question. So you remember I said there are certain hereditary practices, customary practices. Bedia, Banchada, Nat Samudaya from Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, and the Devdasis from the Karnataka Maharashtra belt. These are victims of those practices, the customary practices. And very often we feel that because it is customary, let's not do anything about it. Let them continue to be because it's a choice they are making. If you and I are never ever told that you and I can also choose to be in Wilson College, to be in Tata Institute, to be in IIT, where, where is my aspiration going to come? It's only when we say, well, this, this, this intergenerational cycle can be disrupted. That it's your right and this, you know, disrupting is your right. It's only then that I start thinking differently, you know. Whereas women, the young girls that we've worked with from Bedia, Banchada, they are groomed by the time they are 12 and 13 to believe that this is what it is for them. That the fact that you were born in this community, this is all that we do and nothing else. Right? And this is what we need to change. And this is what Prerna has been trying to do for last several years. We started our work by breaking the intergenerational cycle in the sex trade and moved on to now working and socializing this understanding that we need to work, we can't turn a blind eye and say, well, ye to paramparik hai. You know, you cannot say violence paramparik rahega, no? You cannot say that what is so proud to be paramparik when it comes to violence. This is violence. We, you know, the it is very sad that we don't see these things as violence. A girl coming and saying, I'm fine, you know, a 14-year and 15-year-old girl coming and saying, well, I'm fine you know, dancing in a dance bar and entertaining a customer who's three times my age. I think something should really stir in us, yeah? 
what is happening in this society why is it that you know a girl only from bedia community says that and doesn't say it from atiya's family or doesn't say it from preeti patkar's family or doesn't say it from yamuna's family i'm not offending you all huh? please don't get me wrong but why is it that a girl from my family aspires to be a doctor you know these are questions we should ask and more so on platforms like this more so that's why i loved your theme of bhedbhav this is bhedbhav no reserving only sex trade for a future in the sex trade for a girl born in bedia banchda nat samudaya and reserving something else for me and my daughter and my grandchildren this is bhedbhav sakshi could i answer your question and i'm so glad you brought it up yes we work with these we work a lot with these these girls we constantly rescued from the sex trade and we're constantly supporting them preparing a safety plan for them working with their families so that they are involved in a safety plan working on a rehabilitation plan for them all that Are we good? If we have no more questions, I think that's it, ma'am. I think. Okay, great, great. Once again, we... congratulations to all of you on you know observing uh, Human Rights Week and you know bringing in such varied topics for discussion, which are you know very often not discussed. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. And we'd also like to offer uh, a very official word of thanks to you as well, <laughs> from, um, the PSA side, and from all of us volunteers, everyone who attended. Thank you so much. This thanks. has been beyond informative, ma'am. The way you've answered the questions, you know, the way you framed the whole timeline of uh, the session today. So thank you so much, and thank you for pro providing us the link for your feedback as well. We'll be providing you with the responses that we get. and okay. this has truly i can speak for myself personally and my peers it's truly opened my eyes to you know the world that plight more than any other uh, resource has thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you and all the best to all of you bye take bye, care bye ma'am thank care. you